In the last video, we looked at the idea of the size of neutral atoms and how it changes with the periodic table. Here we're going to look at the effect on cations and anions. So a cation, as a reminder, is an atom that has lost at least one electron, so it becomes positively charged. Electrons are what determine the size of our molecule, or our atom. Remember that the outside part of the atom is made up of electrons, while the proton is, and neutrons are in the middle. So as we get rid of electrons, our atom's going to tend to get smaller if that's the only thing we're changing. So cations are smaller than their neutral atom counterparts. So if you compare here lithium to lithium plus, lithium plus is significantly smaller. In addition to the fact that you're just removing more electrons without changing the proton so it gets smaller, the decrease in size can also be described as coming from the fact that the remaining electrons in the cation feel a larger effective nuclear charge than a neutral atom with the same number of electrons. So what this means is, let's say we were to compare lithium plus and helium. Both of these atoms have two electrons, but lithium has three protons, whereas helium only has two protons. That means that lithium plus is going to be smaller than helium, even though they both have two electrons. So even though they have the same number of electrons, lithium has more protons, and those more protons will pull those electrons in. So this is how we can figure out which atom will be smaller or bigger when comparing two atoms with the same number of electrons. Now the examples in the picture on the right are of atoms where you're comparing the version that is neutral to the version that has lost an electron. So lithium has three electrons and three protons, whereas helium, sorry, lithium plus, not helium this time, has only two electrons, but it still has three protons. So this explanation right here is related to, can help us understand that, that it's going to feel a larger effect of nuclear charge on the remaining electrons, and they're going to get pulled in so that it becomes smaller. In addition to this pattern, the same pattern applies for atoms that applies to cations. That means if you've got the same charge, that cations are going to get larger going down the periodic table as well as going towards the left. So for example, sodium plus is going to be larger than lithium plus. They're both plus one, but sodium's further down the periodic table. It'll continue K plus potassium, its ion, Plus one is going to be bigger than sodium, and rubidium's plus one is going to be larger than potassium. So that continues. It also works when comparing going from left to right. So rubidium plus is going to be larger than strontium two plus, since as you go towards the right, you're going to get smaller. So my rubidium two plus is going to be larger than strontium two plus. So, and that's just a reminder, yes, cations are, go away. Cations are smaller going up the periodic table and towards the right side of the periodic table. So remember, get small as you go up and right, big as you go down and left. We can also look at anions, which have a similar type of setup. It's basically every rule we just said for cations, but the opposite, in, if it gets smaller, it gets bigger. This is because with an anion, we are gaining an electron. So as a reminder, which, ah, the anions are atoms that gained electrons. So for example, fluorine in its neutral state can gain one electron to become F minus. So this means that anions are going to be larger because they now have more electrons. And this increase in size comes to the fact that those electrons in the anion are going to feel a smaller effective nuclear charge compared to the neutral atom. So in this case we have F minus and we can compare it to its similar number of electrons, neon. These cases both contain 10 electrons. Neon has 10 protons. Fluorine has 9 protons. Fluorine is minus, the ion, is larger in size than neon. Because as fewer protons, there's fewer protons to pull in the electrons, so they're able to be further away from the nucleus. Just like cations, the same patterns for neutral atoms also apply to these. So as you go down the periodic table, as you can see here, we go down, they get bigger. You go to the left, they get bigger. So for example, I minus isn't as big as Te2 minus. And then going up and down, O2 minus is smaller than S2 minus. So those patterns don't change. 
Now let's do some practice problems. I want you to try comparing each of these for the top question and for the bottom question, put those in an order of increasing size. So start smallest, go to biggest. So pause here and give that a try. Okay, let's take a look at these now. So first we have magnesium versus magnesium two plus. These are the same atom, but one has lost electrons. So when you lose electrons, you get smaller. That means that magnesium is going to be the largest. On the other hand, when you gain electrons, you get bigger. So between Cl and Cl minus, Cl minus is going to be the biggest. Now let's look at some where we're using trends where they have the same type of charge, but they're in different places on the periodic table. So Cl minus is below F minus. That means just like with neutral atoms, like Cl is bigger than F, Cl minus is bigger than F minus. Similar idea here, lithium plus versus sodium plus. Sodium plus is below lithium plus. That means sodium plus is going to be our largest. Now for this question down here about increasing size, it helps to check and see that these do indeed have the same number of electrons. All of these end up at 18 electrons each. Since they all have 18 electrons, the only thing affecting its size is going to be the number of protons. So as you have fewer of protons, you are big. As you have lots of protons, you are small. So the ones with the fewest number of protons, or with the most number of protons are going to pull the electrons in the most. So for example here, calcium 2 plus has 20 protons, which is more than all of these, but it still has 18 electrons. So calcium 2 plus is going to be our smallest because it's going to pull the electrons in the best. We then go that our next biggest is going to be potassium. We're then going to go to the neutral argon. We'll then go to chlorine minus. And then finally, the largest among these is going to be S2 minus, with it only having let's see, 16 protons with 18 electrons. So it can't pull them in as well, it gets really big. So these are the types of questions I can ask about trends related to ions. You may notice that some of the questions, like the third and fourth examples up here, these two, those are ones that are basically the same way as the atomic size, whereas the others you also have to think about what is the effect of the ion about adding or subtracting electrons. We've got some more trends to look at. Let's take a look at ionization energy. So first we need a definition. Ionization energy is the minimum energy needed to remove one electron from an atom or ion in the gas phase. It's important to note that it will always require an input of energy to remove an electron. I don't get to say always all that often in chemistry. I've learned. I usually say usually, but here I can say always. It takes energy to take an electron and remove it from the, from the atom. Once the electron is removed, it becomes increasingly difficult to remove more electrons. So each time you try to take away an electron from a system, it's going to get harder and harder to do. A particular ionization energy we talk about probably the most is the first ionization energy. This is the amount of energy to remove an electron from a neutral atom. So we have some atom we're going to represent with the term X. Remember, these are always for gas phase, but it's ionization energy. We have to input an energy, which we're just going to write as IE1, where the one stands for the first and IE stands for ionization energy. If we put this energy in, that'll be enough to pull the electron away. So if we take the electron away from a neutral atom, it becomes a plus charge, it's still in the gas phase, and now we have one electron as well. As you might imagine, if you had the second ionization energy, that's the amount of energy to remove the second electron, or to remove an electron from a plus one ion, since that means it's already lost one. So there we start with the plus one, we add IE2, which is the amount of energy required to remove a second electron, we now get a plus two ion, and we get another electron out. The pattern continues as long as the atom has remaining electrons with each ionization energy increasing in value. So IE2 will be bigger than IE1, IE3 will be bigger than IE2, and if you keep going on an atom that has lots of electrons, IE24 will be, harder than, will be larger than IE23. This is a pattern of what first ionization energies look like. You may notice that the noble gases are all really, really high compared to everything else. This is because those are particularly stable conformations. That's the thing our atoms want to get to we talked about in the last chapter. So once they're there, they don't really want to lose any electrons. They're content, so it takes a lot more energy. Then, for example, the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, those only have one extra electron before they become like a noble gas. They're much easier to take the electrons away from. In effect, they're like, please, just take my electron. It would be similar to you think of a bully trying to take a kid's lunch money. Lithium is the one that goes, okay, look, just, just take my money. You don't even have to ask. Basically, here you go. Whereas helium's like, no, no, I'm a fellow bully. You're going to have to really be, I'm going to fight back hard. So between them, we can think about that as helium is incredibly hard. He's a pretty fit third grader. He's going to fight back. 
Whereas lithium is kind of puny. It's like, please, take my electron. Please. I, you have to give me a little bit of effort, but just barely. Now, what are these periodic trends? How do we think about this for the first ionization energy going across the periodic table? So this is going to be the in words version of that picture we just saw. So ionization energy is going to decrease as you go down the periodic table. That's because the valence electrons get further away from the nucleus. They don't hold on to them as far. So for example, francium is all the way at the bottom of the periodic table in the bottom left. It doesn't hold on very hard compared to if you were to say lithium. Even though lithium is ready to give away its electron, francium is even more ready because francium is so far down the periodic table. So it is really big. So it's, let's see, it's the 87th electron of francium barely sees the nucleus in the middle. It's like, gosh, you're so far away. I don't even know there's one there. I guess I don't need to stay around this nucleus and it can leave. The first ionization energy also decreases as you go towards the left side of the periodic table. This is because the atoms on the left side of the periodic table have smaller effective nuclear charges. So there's less positive charge to attract the electron to the nucleus. This is why in our example from the picture, lithium was so ready to give up its electron. It's really far to the left. Whereas helium is all the way to the right. Or if you were to look at something like fluorine, fluorine really has a high ionization energy because it wants to keep its electron. You would put a lot of energy in to take it away. And the opposite of these trends are also true. So it's not, so as you go up and to the right, the ionization energy increases. So that means that francium is going to have an incredibly low ionization energy, whereas fluorine will have a very high ionization energy. I like to use these two atoms as anchors when I think about ideas because francium's in the bottom left, fluorine is in the top right. They make good points of what happens to fluorine, what happens to francium, and then I can apply that idea to things closer to the middle. Now, what about ionization energies beyond the first one? So step one, each additional electron that is removed requires more energy to remove always. You're not going to get one where, oh, you took my eighth electron, now the ninth is easier. It's always going to get harder. In most cases, the increase in energy is fairly regular. So for example, if you compare the first to the second ionization second the first to the second ionization energy, and it takes 600 joules more energy from the jump from IE1 to IE2, then when you compare to IE2, IE3, it's going to also take about 600 more. It might take like 640 more or 660 more, but it's going to be a fairly steady pattern where they take just a little bit more each time in most cases. And I said most for a reason, because how once an ion reaches its noble gas configuration, it reaches a fairly stable configuration. If you try to take another electron, it's going to be significantly harder, and that's going to make the increase really, really large. This is shown in the figure to the right. Sodium, after it loses one electron, becomes a noble gas. Going between one and two is a jump of around 44,000, whereas the jump from zero to one was 496, and the jump from two to three was only about, let's see, 2.4,000. So the jump was biggest between the first and second because the, after it lost one electron, it became a noble gas. Magnesium becomes noble gas after it loses two electrons. So you'll notice the jump is about 700 and then a little more than 700 for the first and second. But when you go second to third, the jump is 6,300. So it makes a huge jump between second and third because once magnesium becomes Mg2+, it's a noble gas configuration. It doesn't want to lose a third electron. So another table that helps us look at this idea and see it would be to compare a bunch of atoms that here, sodium all the way to argon, and look and see that this line that's drawn here represents the change from valence to core electrons. Once you lose all your valence electrons, you have a noble gas configuration. And then each time, there's a huge jump there. Like sodium, it goes up by 4,000, where it was only 496. Magnesium is just at 1450, goes all the way to 7,700. Then go to something like phosphorus. It loses its first five electrons. It takes 6,270 kilojoules per mole. Then to go to the six ionization energy, it jumps all the way to 22,000. So it jumps, let's see, that would be 16, 000, about 16,000, whereas it was only at 6,000 kilojoules before. So it took two and a half times the energy just for increase. It, so remember, these are always increases, so it takes that much more energy. So it still took the original 6,200 plus another 16,000 to get rid of that sixth electron. So the important statement here is you can figure out where your core electrons are, but where you have a giant jump. So if you look at list of ionization energies, once the jump gets really, really large, that's likely a transition from valence to core, and you can figure out how many valence electrons your atom has. We've got a couple more trends. These are a bit shorter. So let's talk about electron affinity. Again, we need a definition. So electron affinity is the amount of energy associated with the addition of one electron 
to an atom in the gas phase. So we have metal with a gas, as a gas, plus one electron. And, or sorry, I used M. This can be any atom. It doesn't have to be a metal. Sorry, I meant to put an X here. So any atom in the gas phase, you add an electron, it becomes a negative one ion. And when you do that, since it gained an electron, it's going to release some energy. And that's going to be our electron affinity energy. The more energy you release, the larger the electron affinity. And by larger, in this case, we mean that it becomes more negative. So this is just a way of, so I'm going to purposely, whenever I ask you a question, ask about when does the electron affinity become more negative. The language surrounding this can sometimes be confusing because people will say, oh, it has a larger electron affinity, when what they mean is it becomes a more negative number. But a negative number is smaller also, so it can be strange to think about, and it's something that people just assume that you would understand contextually. For this reason, any question I ask will ask about it, when does it become more or less negative to emphasize that effect? So that way you don't get confused of, wait, he said larger. Does larger mean more negative? Or does it mean when it becomes more negative, it's actually a smaller number? That's to avoid that problem. But do understand that if you read other sources, that's sometimes how it is worded. And the electron affinities become more negative going left to right across the periodic table. So as you go towards the right, the electron affinity will become more negative. It will give off more energy when it gains an electron. So if you were to compare fluorine and lithium that are on different sides of the periodic table, fluorine's towards the right, so it's going to be more negative than lithium, which is far towards the left. Fluorine would have a larger energy jump, or give off more energy when it gained an electron, whereas lithium is not going to give off near as much. As those electron affinities become more negative, it also means the atom is more willing to accept an electron. It is easier because it really, really wants one, so it doesn't take as much effort. It's easier to get it to take one, because remember, that electron had to come from somewhere, and as we learned in the ionization energy section, ionization energy is a cost to get rid of an electron from something else. So often, you've got to have a source of electrons, so something's going to lose it so that this atom can gain it. So if it really likes gaining it, it's easier for another atom to lose it then. So it matches our pattern with halogens. So as you go to the far right of the periodic table, not worrying about the noble gases, it wants electrons more compared to most other atoms. So we talked about how much they wanted electrons. The ones on the far right really like them. So fluorine, because we learned all halogens are going to be ones that like to gain electrons, tend to become negatively charged, and they have high electron affinity to match. Our last trend we're going to cover is metallic character. So as atoms go towards the top and right of the periodic table, they become less metallic. As they go towards the bottom and the left, they become more metallic. Metals and nonmetals have some characteristics that describe them, so it's important. Like you may, you probably have some qualitative idea of you know certain substances are metals in everyday life and some substances are nonmetals. So what do we mean as a chemist when we say metal and nonmetal? Like how can something be less metallic but still be a metal? Well, metals are malleable and ductile, which means they can be done things like you can pound them into sheets or you can make them into wires. They conduct heat and electricity well. They're shiny and reflect light. They tend to form cations when they're dissolved in water. And we'll talk later about a concept of, related to oxidation and reduction. I purposely leave it off here. Once we get to the chapter on reduction and oxidation chemistry, there's another property of metals about how well they accept electrons or, or give them up. Nonmetals, similarly, or not similarly, like the exact opposite. They're brittle, so you can't easily turn them into a wire or put them into a plate because they'll break apart. They're very brittle. They function as insulators, which is the obvious, opposite of being a good conductor. That means that heat and electricity don't travel across them very well. They tend to be dull and non-reflective, and they're more likely to form anions when dissolved in water. And we'll come back to this again when we get to redox chemistry. We'll talk about what do nonmetals tend to do once we get to there in a few chapters. But I just mention it here to say there's more to do with metals and nonmetals. We're not stopping with it here. So finally, I want to draw a summary that goes through all the trends. And I think if you can learn this, you can get all the trends down and answer the questions pretty easily. So I'm gonna have one arrow going this way and one arrow going this way. So this is an arrow that describes the periodic table. So as you go up and right, that means that your ionization energy is gonna go up. It also means that your electron affinity is going to become more negative. That also means at the end of this arrow for the other way, that means towards the bottom and left, i.e. ionization energy goes down, it's low. And our electron affinity is going to tend to be less negative. 
So that's for our first arrow. What do we know going up and right? So now let's say going down and left. What happens there? Down and left is where your size goes up. Your atoms get bigger. That says size goes up. I, the letter, I should have better spacing. You're also going to get atoms that are more metallic. On the other end of this arrow, in the top right, you have things of your size goes down. That's where your small atoms are. And things become more non-metallic. So if you're a non-metal, you're going to be somewhere towards the up and right part of the periodic table. If you learn these two arrows, this summarizes all of the trends covered in this video and the last one and can help make those questions a lot easier to do. You can also search for pictures of this. I think there's a really good one on Wikipedia, if I remember right, that does it that's prettier than mine and puts it on top of a periodic table. And I'm sure there are other ones. Like I remember just looking up electron affinity trends and I read the Wikipedia article and it had a really nice picture. So if you go and find someone else, if you find mine not as pretty, that's okay. I am not going to win any awards for art. But if you learn these four trends based on these arrows, you should be good to go. Just make sure you also know the definitions because if you know ionization energy goes up when you go up and right and we were to ask, well, what does that mean? You need to know, oh, that's how much energy to take an electron away from an atom in the gas state to take a single electron away. So that finishes up this chapter. And from now on, we'll be starting our next chapter on molecules in my next video.